Hello, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Hello. So, um, there is a, a move. I don't know. I don't know if I would call it a movement. Oh, uh, what is your name? There, um, Who are we speaking with? Uh, Brian. It's Brian. Brian, welcome. Okay. Uh, so, there are um, some Christians, and maybe uh, this like idea would also be adopted by the, the Messianics, that um, they really hold on to the teachings of, of J.C. rather than of Paul. Um, and like I heard some Christians say, that, oh, no, but Paul contradicts J.C. and this and that and, and a bunch of other things. And um, interestingly enough, last week's parasha, parasha Shoftim, talks about a prophet that speaks in the name of Hashem, yet um, he actually isn't saying what Hashem told him to say, or like if he says something and it doesn't come true, then not to fear him. So basically my question would be, um, are there any explicit teachings or alleged teachings, of course, that JC taught that were against the Torah <laughs> um, that would, I guess, already like help? Because Paul, you can, there's countless things that he says that are against the Torah, but uh, people really like to hold on to JC. Okay, Brian, go ahead and hang him now and you continue for your answer, okay? Thank you for your call. Okay, thank you. You bet. All right, bye. And timing-wise, uh, Rabbi, how are you doing on timing? Well, we'll take this as our last question. Okay, very good. All right. Go over there, man. This is a tricky question. I, I, I kind of wasn't sure where you were going to go with this, Brian, and I was following you on this path. Uh, it's interesting, first, that there is an iteration of the Messianic movement, which is Christianity, uh, but with Jewish symbols, icons, and traditions. But there is, from the Messianic movement, there are there is so many sects. And they're killing each other. There's so many fights between one messianic group and another group. They're all putting each other in, excommunicating each other. So as it turns out, there are some messianic groups today that are emerging. And I've met some of these guys who don't believe in Paul at all. And they believe that Paul was a heretic, kind of like the Ebionite movement or like the Nazarene movement that were told about from in the writings of the Church Fathers. I met these people. They, to them, Paul's a complete heretic, but they believe in, in the Gospels. Um, so I thought that was what you you were going to ask about. So that, there is. These are, I don't know how large these numbers are, but they're there. Um, but you're asking, did, did Jesus himself teach anything that's against the Torah? There's a really big problem here. The really big problem here is that what did Jesus teach that's against the Torah? Now, I would just caution you as a caveat to not say JC. It's better to just say Jesus. It's better not say any of it because the Torah says, Lo yisha it shouldn't be heard on your mouth. But if you're going to say anything, say Jesus. But to say JC is really an acronym for Jesus Christ, meaning Jesus the Messiah. So you're kind of saying what you don't want to say. So a lot of people say JC, and it's really a good idea not to. Because that's pretty much the worst thing you could say. Um, so the, the problem is that I don't believe that that Jesus said these things. Or I can't say he didn't say anything in the Gospels, but I, I just, um, I, I think, the problem is that the Gospels are very late. They're written 40 years after when Christians uh, believe um, that Jesus was crucified to, eight, to from 60 years, from 70, which is 40 years later, to 65 years later for the book of John. So there's so much mythology and overlay and overlay. Can anything be said uh, in, can anything in the Christian Bible in any way accurately reflect what Jesus might have said? And I don't believe that. I think the, so therefore I'm sort of stuck and I, I don't want to make up stuff because that's what I'm fighting against. I'm fighting against people who've made up an entire religion. I, he, I could more accurately say what he didn't say than what he said. Jesus definitely did not walk around saying he's the Messiah. That definitely was a later invention. 
And after he died, people thought that he was the Messiah, and the Messiah is supposed to die for mankind. He didn't walk around. It, I can't say for sure, but it's incredibly unlikely. Why? Because if we go back to the to the Synoptic Gospels and even go further, go to the to the foundation of the Synoptic Gospels, Mark. Well, Mark is only sixteen chapters, only six hundred and seventy eight verses. The first eight chapters, Jesus doesn't tell anybody who he is. Why not? And he's certainly not walking around going, I'm this and I'm that, and I'm the bread of life, and I'm I'm the vine, and I'm the way that you he didn't do any of that. He didn't not only that, if somebody was Khishish, anyone suspected that he might be the Messiah, shh, don't tell anybody. So the, the more likely thing is that he never made any of those claims. How but, so it's unlikely that the author of Mark would have invented the idea that Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah when he really did claim to be the Messiah. That would not make sense. It would make a lot of sense for Christians to later claim that Jesus claimed to be the Messiah when in fact he didn't. I mean, there's always a reason for Christians to high, heighten the Christology, not to lower it. So, so therefore, this is so. This is not a true answer. Yes, if Jesus said, "I am the truth, the way, and the life; no one can come to the Father but by me." If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So then, he would have been a, a very wicked man. I hope for Jesus' sake, for his sake, that he never said such filth out of his mouth. I hope so. I can't know if he said it. I'm straight away. But I, our tradition is that Jesus did not claim to be the Messiah, but that claim was made for him. And that would fit well with the Gospels, where Jesus, right before he's crucified, after a one-year, as in the Synoptics, or a three-year ministry, as in John, Jesus turns to the people who are around him all the time and asks them, who do you say that I am? And they don't know. And then when Peter says in Matthew 16, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus says that flesh and blood did not, could not have revealed that to you. Well, what do you mean? Didn't Jesus walk around telling everybody that he's the Messiah? Do you understand what's going on? Now, why, how the heck did that ever wind up in the Christian canon? So there could be only one explanation, is to explain away a problem that early Christians had. And that is that from what we've heard, because it began with oral stuff, there's all these fake religions. People say, but he, the guy, no, nah, I was told the guy never claimed it. He was like, oh, yeah, it was a, the biggest secret in the world. They said, to, to read the book of Mark, how long would it take? It wouldn't take you two hours. If you read the book of Mark, it would, really would not take a long time. And that's and, and the reason why people don't notice this is that everybody who's read the book of Mark read the book of Matthew first. This is the biggest nightmare. This is what made Augustine a genius, a, a, a demonic genius, to order Matthew first. Because if people would read Mark first before ever have read, read Matthew, they would be astonished. When they, when they got to Matthew, well, how did the virgin birth get there? But they would be astonished that, that Jesus is just, it's the biggest secret in the world, who he is. And I find that the most intriguing part of Mark. I mean, Mark is interesting because there's less layers of mythology. And there's still a, a load of it. And I can go through with you and show you how the narrator of Mark is infusing stuff. There was clearly an earlier... Um, oral tradition or text that just didn't survive. Very likely a text. And they could show it to you, but I'm not doing it now because we'll, we'll be going too far away. Um, all New Testament scholars would agree with this. Um, so, so therefore, it would, it, if you read Mark and never had read, read Matthew, that never happens because every person reading a New Testament logically just goes to 
the first gospel, which is Matthew, but it's out of chronological order. And therefore, when you get to Mark, having finished Matthew, because the synoptic, synoptic, what does that word mean? It's two Greek words with the same view. They're very similar, the first three gospels. That's why they're called synoptic gospels. They're not, they're really, there are quite striking differences between them. But there's a structure, there's, you know, there's a lot of similarities between them. There's a lot, a lot of similarities between them. So if, you re, if your mind is colored with Matthew, so then when you get to Mark, which is absent of so many colors, you just insert what you think must be there. I've spoken to Christians who didn't know that there's no infancy narrative in the book of Mark. And they go, what? I, I didn't know that. Jesus is not baptized in the book of John. What? They just, you know, they, they just assume he must have been baptized like we have in the synoptic gospels because it's all colored. They're all, the stories are colored from the previous book. It's brilliantly done to put Matthew first. It's evil, but brilliant. It's diabolic. So, what did Jesus? I can go a list of what Jesus said, grotesque things that he said, of, of heightening his own importance. But I don't for a minute believe that Jesus walked around saying any ridiculous things. And these were put in later. And even the first, the synoptic gospels didn't think that Jesus walked around saying any of those things because it would be inconceivable. You would have to lose your mind to believe that Matthew just didn't think that Jesus' I am's were important enough to mention. The I and the Father are one. Before Abraham was I am, John 8, 58. It's just not conceivable. So, um, so therefore, it's a, a big mosh pit of shekiv, of of lies and, and deceit. I, I don't mean that in a bad way. I can't believe what I just said. I'm not trying to be offensive, but it's just layers of mythology, one on top of the other. And Christian Christians are good people. A lot of them are, not all, but a lot of them are good people. But just, you grow up and you, your grandmother tells you Jesus loves you, and that's how you go to bed at night. You believe this stuff. Christians have to get to Tanakh, start reading the Jewish scriptures. And then when they go to the New Testament, they'll go, whoa, there's no relationship between the two. I can't, I don't know that Jesus really said that what enters your mouth doesn't defile you. Like what goes into, what comes out of your mouth doesn't defile you. Excuse me, what goes into your mouth doesn't defile you. What goes out of your mouth doesn't defile you. And therefore, the narrator goes on in Mark 7, and therefore making all foods clean. So it's very clear that the narrator put that word, that therefore in. Right? He inserted that on top of some previous text. But I, I'm not going to sit here honestly on air and go tell you I think Jesus said that. Could have, but it would violate the verisimilitude that we would ordinarily use as a measuring stick to know what is likely to have occurred. Verisimilitude. You can hear the two Latin words. Something that is would match in some way a Pharisaic world. It would make sense that he would, that anyone in the coming, emerging from the Pharisaic world would say something so stupid like that. Uh, it would certainly go, would be fabulous for all the pork eaters later for the Greeks. When I say Greeks, I mean Gentiles in a sense. For them, they'll be very happy as could be that they can eat all these, do all these things, and it's not a problem. I mean, this is not complicated, but I, I honestly, I can't tell you. Paul is a whole different book. Paul, I can tell you exactly what he thought and meant. I know exactly every second what Paul thought. I know exactly what, I, I, and I know how tormented he was. I know things about him most people don't understand about him because I can read his writings. Jesus didn't write anything except for something in the sand, but that's even a fake. <laughs> I know I'm God. But Paul's letters are really from the hand of Paul, especially seven of them. So I really can get a, a very uh, good snapshot of Paul. And, it, and he's very consistent in, a, in an unpleasant way. And 
one of the true enemies of God, really, really one of the despicable people of history who did so much damage to the world. One person did so much damage. So, um, anyways, thank you very much for your question. Shalom, and William. Yes, sir. Shalom to you as well. Uh, it's been a great show as usual. Uh, and you guys, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel and turn on notifications. And uh, once again, uh, Rabbi, it's always a pleasure having you here. Look forward to each show. Always each week, a so. big pleasure. Without this show, <laughs> forget about it. But thank God you have me. You're okay. Absolutely. <laughs> there you go.